Hello, this is News Now from the Belmont Journal, and we are joined by Lisa Gibellario, Prevention Specialist with the Wayside Youth and Family Support Network and Coordinator of the Belmont Wellness Coalition. And I'm your host on today's program, Mike Crowley. Today, we're talking about how parents and families can be preparing for return to full in-person learning in our schools. And for disclosure, I am a member of the school committee, although we are not talking about my views on this program. And we're glad you can join us today, Lisa. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here as always. All right, so Lisa, as the Belmont Public Schools are preparing to bring children back to the classrooms for full day in-person learning, what can you tell families about virus transmission in the classroom? What do we know about, what do we know about this at this time? So keeping in mind, Mike, that the science is not 100%, um, it's based on probabilities, and furthermore, it's based on the past year where most um, classes were hybrid, so half the students in the class. I think that's important to note. But with all of that said, there's very, there has been very low virus transmission among elementary kids. Um, the numbers do tick up a little bit as the kids get older, but of course it's not crystal clear if um, the virus was transmitted in the classroom or you know, perhaps you know, grocery shopping with mom or dad. So it, it's still difficult to pinpoint um, where the transmission may have taken place, but we do know that it's very low in elementary, but ticks up a little bit for middle and high school. Okay, and I, and I think, Lisa, that we don't have any cases that are definitively, um, um, that, that definitively are tied to in-classroom transmission or in-school transmission. That's true for Belmont, right? Yeah, uh, not yeah. necessarily. I, uh, the data that I was um, referencing is more statewide data. Oh, I see. Thank um, you. But yes, for Belmont, that's true. Okay. So um, um, par parents across Belmont, Lisa, are making decisions about whether they're going to send their children to full and day in-person school or go with a remote option. What are some of the things that parents should be thinking about from your perspective? So what I would advise families um, to consider, Mike, are the following. Number one, are the adults in the household vaccinated or are they on target to be vaccinated? That's an important question. Um, are there any underlying health conditions in the family, either the kids or the adults? Because we know that if someone is immunocompromised that their risk of, of getting the virus, um, that risk increases. Are there grandparents who are, who are a more vulnerable population living at home in the household? And um, perhaps by now they are vaccinated, which would be great news, but that's a, that's a third consideration. And then I would also, you know, check in with the kids. Are, are the kids um, really anxious to go back to school? Are they excited to go back to school? Um, or are the kids more comfortable staying home? Um, so those are the some of the conversations that I would advise families to engage in. So Lisa, tell me, tell me what, what you would advise in situations where, um, you know, the, the parents are really not on the same page about these kinds of decisions. Yeah, so I've heard from parents where the kids are excited and the parents are hesitant or vice versa. Um, the parents are ready to have the kids get back into school and the kids are, are not 100% sure. So I think as with many family topics, this is going to require open, honest conversations, right? Parents need to understand the root causes of their children's anxiety. Let's just presume that the children are anxious. Is it about contracting COVID-19? Is it social anxiety? you know, that's a possibility. Is it just that they're really comfortable sitting in their jammies, you know, in their bedroom learning that way? Um, so I think for, especially for those students, the subset of students who have been remote all along, who did not step into hybrid. So I think families are going to have to engage in honest conversations. I would advise parents who are feeling a little anxious and a little concerned to take a look at the data, the data I just referenced on in-school transmission, and to look at the safety protocols that are going to happen with regard to the air purifying, with regard to open windows and mask wearing. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, steep yourself in some of the data that's available. And then Mike, what this is going to come down to for a lot of families is a risk benefit analysis, right? So there, there may be, you may want to weigh the benefits of having your child in school, knowing that there is some risk. 
Um, right. We cannot eradicate risk uh, in anything that we do. So there will be some risk. So, but there will be some benefits, maybe seeing friends, seeing the teacher, um, you know, just getting out of the house is a benefit. Or if your children are anxious, perhaps there's just more benefits in staying remote. Um, maybe it's just better for their mental health. I mean, mental health, the mental health argument cuts both ways. There are children who are going to, perhaps their anxiety will spike if they have to go back um, or their, or their mental health depression could spike if they continue to stay home. One thing that we've learned, Mike, this past year is that um, there are mental health impacts to COVID-19, that's been very clear. And also that different people are wired to handle risk differently. This is something that has played out for over 13 months. There are some people who really are okay with taking some risks. Um, and there are other people who started ordering their groceries to have them delivered, didn't wanna be in a grocery store. If they so much as had to pop into CVS for a quick prescription, they put on three masks. So um, our ability to be with risk gets played out as we evaluate what to do now. Um, so, so, so Lisa, I mean, we, we, we live in a, in, a, in a world in which there, there are risks um, in everything that we do. And, and so I, you know, my, my next question really is, you know, with the risk, uh, with the risk uh, mitigation measures, the safety protocols that, that will be in place, um, what are your thoughts about the, the adequacy? So I think that the schools are doing, the school department is doing the best that it can to keep our kids as safe as they can be. Um, I don't think it's perfect, but I, I, I as a public health professional, would not necessarily endorse indoor mask breaks. Um, I'm not 100% sure two or three kids sitting on a bus seat, even with windows open and masks on, is appropriate. I, I think that you don't get any distancing that way. Um, but he here are the things we do know to be true, that mask wearing, when masks are worn well, which of course the, uh, mask wearing is variable with little ones, but when masks are worn well, they are effective. We know that the air windows open is a really good safety measure. Um, the outdoor tents will certainly um, mitigate risk while the kids are eating if they can keep some distance. But, but you're right, Mike, none of this is 100%. Um, as we said a few minutes ago, and none of this is, has real, clear, perfect science behind it. It is science that is evolving and, and the medical science, public health world is still discussing three feet versus six feet. But I guess I would say that if you can tolerate some risk um, and you're on your way to getting vaccinated, I, I would never judge anyone who is choosing to go back to school full time. I think that the risks are probably fairly low, although you know nothing is 100%. All right, Lisa, big decisions for parents in school reopening. Um, and, and so we, we, we thank you again for talking with us and we will see you next time. Thank you, Mike, yes. All right, thank you, Lisa.